Okay, members, we will now move on to questions to the Minister for Communities. And before I call Trevor Lund to speak, just to remind members that question seven has been withdrawn. So I call Trevor Lund. Gormie Haggart, Cam Coyle, Kirsty over to him. That's question one, Minister. Hey, Trevor. Um, so I recognise that there is an impact on waiting times for all appeal types as a result of the pandemic. My department has worked with the President of the Appeals Tribunals to offer appellants a range of hearing type options, including face to face oral hearings, oral hearings using teleconference, oral hearings using video link facilities, a paper determination based on papers before the tribunal panel. Paper determination cases only commenced on the 6th of July. Oral hearings using technology options will com commence from the effect of today, the 20th of September. Face-to-face -face oral hearings are, hearings are set to recommence from mid-October at the main hearing centre, and a vast alternative accommodation options be sought to facilitate hearings in local towns and villages. Trevor Lund, supplementary. Yes, I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, she'll, she'll be aware of the almost 40 per cent of hearings which are actually unsuccessful at the moment. Uh, could I ask her what's been done to improve the situation in terms of support for the advice centre to build skills and expertise to help people with these hearings to try and improve that figure? Well, I concur with the member in terms of the, the support that the independent advice sector give people going through this process is very much valued by myself and my department. I'm currently looking at funding for the independent advice sector, including some of the grassroots groups and even through the appeal service and others. Um, and I'm sure the member will agree it is important that we make it as easy for people because when they're in, whether they're appealing or they're applying for this benefit, it's because they really, really need it. And we need to make the process as easy and as simple as possible for them. And I call Fran McCann, supplementary. Thank you, and, uh could I ask the Minister uh, how she intends to address the backlog in the appeal service? I thank the member for his supplementary question. Um, there is a big backlog um, and the appeal service has commenced listings on a number of hearings and will continue to work with the President of the Appeals Tribunals and DEFC to ensure that more cases are listed for hearing. Um, the appeal service have also obtained a number of licences for technology options so they can run a number of hearings at the same time. And they're also refreshing the hearing type options with the appellants using technology options that will hopefully result in earlier dates. Go up. Pat Kedney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Minister. Um, has the Minister considered making any of the jobs and benefits office services that have been available by phone over the past uh, months Permanently accessible by phone, for example, allowing the claimant commitment to be completed by phone rather than in person. Pat, I'm, not, I'm unaware of what the process is in terms of the long-term stuff, but it's certainly something I'm happy to look at because we do need, as a, in response to Trevor Lunn, we need to make this process as easy for people to access as possible. I call Andy Allen. Uh, what impact COVID will have on the capacity in terms of the face-to-face -face assessments and also uh, what work the department will undertake to ensure that a claimant or an appealant is offered the best suitable uh, appeal type for them? Well, the member will be, will be aware that um, even in the last question time this was raised, I think it really is important, first of all, that the hearing takes place as close to the person as possible. So, because as he knows, they're all in Belfast, and everybody who applies for this benefit is from Belfast. So, we need to do that. We also need to ensure that the ability, should it be by telephone, by teleconferencing, or in person, that the ability for someone to, to accompany an applicant is still there. And as other members have raised, that the particularly the advice sector, the independent advice sector that supports people, is properly supported as well to ensure that uh, anyone, should there be an applicant or an appellant, is given the, the support that they need. And more often th than not, it's a very, very stressful process for people who plan for these benefits. Next question, I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank the member for her question. 
So um, the responsibility for coronavirus, coronavirus health protection regulations, as a member knows, lies with the Department of Health. However, my department has published guidance for the private rented sector landlords and tenants, which includes information regarding shared houses. The guidance makes it clear that everyone living in HMOs are members of a single household. I have no doubt that every member of this assembly would join in me, with me in appealing for all people in all types of households to adhere to the regulations and guidance. The operation of licensing of HMOs is a matter for local government and it is, uh, currently is led by Belfast City Council on behalf of all councils, as well as providing support and assistance to councils in the development of HMO licences scheme. My department has provided detailed guidance for local government in the exercise of their functions in relation to HMO licensing and a statutory code of practice for landlords to manage their properties to the required standards. My officials will continue to participate in various cross-departmental groups, including those convened recently by the junior ministers, and continue to work with all stakeholders to address ongoing issues in the Holy Lands. Paula Bradshaw, supplementary. Um, thank you, Minister, for your response. You, you'll be aware that before we had the house parties, we had the house clearances where they were dumping excessively into the alleyways and there was all sorts of vermin and, and um, uh, uh, just basically antisocial um, and very inconsiderate behaviour. It's clear to me um, that the HMO Act as um, as stands at the minute is not strong enough and the enforcement powers given to council are not strong enough either. I'm just wondering, given these experiences in the last um, few months, what, what are you planning to do to make it better? Well, certainly um, my officials have been part of working groups along with Belfast City Council officials and it's quite open in terms of if Belfast City Council officials feel that the parts that they have aren't strong enough, then they need to feed that back to us. Um, certainly, there is a big focus on landlords here, and as well as tenants, because they have to be responsible for their behaviour. Um, but certainly, in the case of strengthening powers, if it does come back from Belfast City Council, who are operating this on behalf of all councils, that there's a need for additional powers and then additional enforcement, I'm happy to look at that. Call Jerry Kelly. Um, the Minister may have answered uh, some of this. Um, my question was around what are the present licensing standards. And uh, we have had some comment from a previous speaker about trying to strengthen them. But surely there is a, an obligation on landlords and uh, managing agents uh, to deal with uh, antisocial behaviour in the buildings uh, which they own or manage. I think all, yes, uh, first of all, I do agree. There is a, an obligation on landlords to ensure that their tenants are re behaving responsibly. Um, there is also a, a focus and certainly a responsibility in landlords because in order to get their licence for HMOs, that they need to have a f fitness testing. And there's also a responsibility of us all to be good neighbours. And where there are instances, and I concur with Paula Bradshaw that even before the return to university started, the world, the world's problems and houses getting cleared and the debris that was left for local residents. And that, you know, unfortunately left Belfast City Council picking the tab up. So there, there is a need to ensure that landlords fully accept the responsibility, including when tenants before they go into the house, when they're in the house and when they leave the house before new tenants come in. Call Steve Egan. Speaker, and thank you very much indeed for the Minister's remarks so far. Um, Minister, you have already talked about sort of the joint approach we're taking towards dealing with antisocial behaviour, and particularly COVID regulations. Could you outline the discussions you've had with the Justice Minister, who last week said that she was willing to participate fully, but not lead these, this joint task force work, in particular in relation to the Holy Lands? Well, the, the member will be aware that the junior ministers, on behalf of the executive, are responsible for con convening the group on behalf of the executive. I, I, for my part, I'm not commenting on what any other ministers do. For my part, if I'm asked to look at additional powers, I'm asked to look at regulations or even additional support for councils, I'm willing to do that. Because, you know, no one should be living in their own homes in fear or unable to get a night's sleep. Their kids are going to school absolutely exhausted um, and their quality of life is completely diminished. And that's unacceptable. 
I do know that universities have stepped up to the challenge as well and trying to ensure that if there are uh, reminders needed that they've been done and that they've been quite public last week. But we seem to be discussing this problem every year and we do need to fix it. Call Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker, um, Minister, you've said that you, if Belfast City Council come to you with a request for enhanced powers around HMOs, then you'll do something about it. But you also just said that this has been a problem for years. So can you take it from me and from others who are representatives for South Belfast, that there's a major structural challenge around HMOs, their density and how they're managed in the Holy Land. And can you please ask your officials not to wait for Belfast City Council to come to you, but to reach out proactively and find out what we can do to sort this problem, whether it's by legislation or better enforcement or whatever else? And the answer is absolutely yes. This problem has been, unfortunately, a perennial problem. Um, uh, you know, up until now, there has been a lot of complaints, but there has been absolutely no requests that I am aware of for changes in the legislation or even asking for additional powers. Now, I'm going to go and check it out after you've raised this point today to be sure. But let me be clear again. If there are requests, then we'll certainly look at them, absolutely look at them. And indeed, I'm not going to pass a book at all. I mean, HMOs was passed on to the Council, but if the Council, on behalf of all the other Councils, are feeling that was, that was passed on in April last year needs tweaked or needs to be changed, then let's have a look at it before the review kicks in next year. Next question, I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question three. Thank the member for her question. Um, so the most re recent waiting list for her constituency stood at 2,167, of which 1,241 applicants were de deemed to be in housing stress. I am acutely aware that these numbers of people currently on the waiting list and those deemed to be in housing stress remains very challenging, not only for your constituency, but right across the entire North. And that's why I'm focusing on seeking to deliver as many new social homes as possible with the available funding, but I'm also keen that we consider ways that we can increase the supply of new social homes to reduce the demand. Cara Hunter, supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, a number of rural communities in my constituency have voiced um, that they do not have enough sufficient social housing uh, provision. Uh, I wonder if the Minister shares my concern on this issue, and can I ask what steps her department are taking to ensure that rural communities are not decimated as a result of lack of uh, suitable housing? The member will be, um, I'm sure, keen to know that I've met with the rural community network on this very issue. I have a responsibility to ensure that there's rural proofing as well. But the main focus and the main responsibility I have is to ensure those in greatest housing need are housed as well. And it is a massive list that we're tackling right across the board. I also know that within rural communities that you know, many have moved or settled in the private rented sector and there's a lack of security of tenure. And it is a big issue and it's something that I'd be taking forward, certainly transformation of housing within the next few weeks. Call Keeve Archibald. I can call you and I thank the Minister for her response. And, and, and I know she'll agree with me that, that, that the levels of housing stress are too high and we do need to tackle that. But in doing so and in making more um, social housing stock available, it's, would the Minister also agree that it's a need to ensure accessible housing as well? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the, this issue has been raised in this Assembly. A lot, you know, about certainly homes to meet the needs of an aging population, but certainly people with disabilities, but also accessible to where people want to live, uh, um, want to raise their families and grow up in. Uh, I also think there's a, a big issue in terms of in the past where our own housing stock was sold under the right to buy and the stock was never replaced. And in many respects, that displaced a lot of communities. And certainly they went to the private rent se rented sector, which was okay at the time because of a lack of security, they've had to move elsewhere, and at times that is quite substantial miles away. So we have a big challenge, but we're certainly very, very aware of what we need to do, particularly in rural communities. I call David Hillage. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for his, her answers thus far. Uh, a few weeks back, there, the Minister rejected a proposal on the floor of the Assembly in relation to lots living over the shops and right you're wrongly that happened but you're right this affects all constituencies right across Northern Ireland 
you are aware of the situation, as you rightly say as well, but how are we going to increase housing for those in housing stress? Well, the reason I rejected living over this scheme was, I mean, I had a lot of reports saying it wasn't value for money. So that is basically the main reason. And for grants to be put into private uh, accommodation over the shops that needed disability access and needed uh, proper storage and space would have meant additional public spend. So it just didn't work out value for money. In terms of ensuring that we increase supply to reduce demand, that, that's the big challenge. So I am going to bring proposals forward in the next lot of weeks, looking at our, even our NDA commitments, looking at revitalising the housing executive, looking at how we can prevent the housing executive or have them exempt from paying corporation tax, so that money will go back in, looking at the historical debt, how we can deal with that so it will allow the housing executive to build. But I am acutely aware that those people who are living in housing stress is now going into three generations, and that is completely unacceptable. Call Claire Bailey. Um, and I'm sure the, the Minister would agree with everyone in the House probably um, that the, the housing stress levels in Northern Ireland are just completely unacceptable. But given that that is already the situation and the financial hardship being levied with COVID, um, I'm also very mindful that some of the, the measures put in place as a response to COVID was a mortgage holiday for many. Can the Minister give us any assurances that no one in Northern Ireland will ever face eviction due to COVID, um, COVID financial hardship? Well, the member will be aware that under Deidre Harkey, she brought forward measures to prevent evictions, particularly during a global pandemic. I continued those and extended them until March next year. Um, unfortunately, you know, like many, many years ago, the mor mortgage relief scheme was taken away by the, the, the Tory government, and, and that did help a lot of people. I have spoken to people, even my own constituency, who are currently receiving mortgage holidays, but that in itself is a very stressful process, even having that. The, the measures that the department, along with the housing executive and housing associations, put in to ensure, first of all, that people weren't evicted are still there. The Housing Rights Service is still there to ensure that anybody who finds himself in that situation get help as early as they possibly can. And what we need to ensure is that evictions under those circumstances are consigned to the past. Moving on, I call Melissa McHugh. I've got Concorla Number four. I thank the member for his question. He will be aware that the executive announced £29 million toward investment to support our culture, language and arts and heritage sectors. This is, an additional, this is additional to the £5.5 million creative fund previously announced. These sectors make a substantial contribution to our local economy, to the quality of our lives, to our health and to our well-being, and in the shaping of our standing as a place to live and work and visit. They are vital to play their role in delivering social renewal for communities and indeed the economy. My department is finalising proposals for a suite of funding schemes to maximise the impact of this very much welcome financial support in these most challenging of times. Melissa McHugh, supplementary. Um, I'm sure like all members just in this assembly are only too well aware to those that at the grassroots level that are really suffering throughout the whole of uh, the COVID crisis, uh, and particularly in terms of their loss of earnings and so on. And uh, how can the Minister ensure just that support to the grassroots uh, within arts and culture is delivered? Well, I also, so I thank the member for his supplementary as well. I have just literally come out of a meeting with Minister Dodds on this very issue in terms of, you know, people who are involved in events and music, uh, in sound and all that you know, background stuff, as well as you know, looking at some of the, the, the bigger establishments. Uh, what I want to say is this, art is an, arts and culture is an evolving thing. So people who are recipients of Arts Council funds are still getting their funds, but there are other groups who have been doing really, really great work, particularly from March, you know, taking the lead, who haven't got one penny, of public funds, and we need to ensure that they're looked after as well. Oh, Meg Nesbitt. And, and I very much welcome uh, the injection of funding for the, for the sector. Minister, what, what scope is there for co-design to ensure that all sections of the sector uh, have their needs addressed? 
Well, I recent, and I thank the member for his question because it's really important, particularly in relation not just to NDNA, but in relation to this process going forward. The weakness is there is no arts and cultural and heritage strategy, none whatsoever. And so we're all kind of, you know, in a big queue, hoping to join that queue, put an application and get something. I mean, that is not a good way to do business. If we accept, and we do, that culture and arts and heritage not only help people but to generate the economy, then they need to be put on a proper footing. So I have met a group of musicians who are looking at a music strategy. I spoke to some freelancers who need to be supported as well. But they've all said long term they need to see an arts and cultural strategy in the same way there's one for sports. And for me, that's a big weakness. Call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister why there is no uh, cultural uh, strategy and how she will ensure that the creative and cultural funding reaches artists and organisations who have lost entire income streams as a result of COVID? Well, the, the reason there was an arts and cultural strategy which is about to be produced and then the Assembly collapsed. So there's one set in arts three years old. And even from what some of the people who contributed to that are saying, it's not reflective of what was there three years ago. I can try and help as many people as possible, but I want to also ensure that those who have never received or had any recourse to public finance, public money or service as well. So if we just look after the big institutions, there's nothing left for anyone else. And I'm sure the member would agree that's not a satisfactory position. Call well, Mark Durgan. John Corlean, I thank the Minister for his answers. I, like everyone else, was delighted to hear the executive announcement last week that the arts were finally getting funded. So well done to you for your role in that. Now you've got the money in, the focus is going to be on how you get the money out, and it is vital that that's done in a fair and equitable way that gets the biggest bang uh, for your buck or our buck. Uh, can or will consideration and assistance be given to those musicians and singers, I think, who have suffered throughout COVID, but were dealt maybe another blow last week with new rules on hospitality that have virtually prohibited them from earning money in that way. That's exactly what I want to try and do as best as I possibly can. It's because of health restrictions that we have had to you know, bring into place as a result of the global pandemic that's prevented people, not just from opening their doors in terms of theatres, but certainly even those people who are performers, maybe even one or two piece bands who've just made their living have been, as you say, faced a double whammy last week. And there's already a fund there now. So anyone you know, it's opened until, the, you know, they're still looking until the end of October in the Arts Council to help people in that situation. But we do need to ensure, you know, until over the next few months, I imagine, that we try and help as many people as possible, particularly those have had no recourse to public funds at all. Call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You've noticed me bobbing up and down there several times. Um, can I thank the Minister for her answers so far? And uh, that indeed, this money is very welcome. Um, I, I know certainly as a committee, we've been lobbied for, for months, it seems like now, for this money to become available. Um, so just on, on that, and you'd mentioned earlier about the amount of people who have never received a penny, who have had nothing from any funding stream, um, just how quickly and uh, are, are we likely to see this money begin to get rolled out? Certainly, I'm looking at finalising the potential schemes this week, talking to executive colleagues next week with a view going straight out into some of the ALBs and then looking at ways in which um, we can try and open up applications um, for others who may have never went to the ALBs before. It's worth mentioning, I know the member knows this, but we've also got museums and libraries involved in this as well. Um, and it is really, really crucial that not only do we keep those doors open, and that's right across a piece, but particularly for the groups who have emerged who are actually doing brilliant work in keeping people mentally well, physically fit, providing enjoyment and entertainment that they're supported as well. And a lot of these people are young people from marginalised and deprived areas, and they need our support as well. Moving on, I call Linda Dillon. Beaver Cook, question number five. Thank the member for her question. Um, I launched the COVID-19 recovery revitalisation programme along with Minister Poots on the 27th of July 
Letters of offer for tranche one of the programme were issued to all councils later that day, and payments totalling almost £6 million for that tranche have now been made to councils to provide much needed support to local businesses as they recover and adapt to the impact of COVID-19. Around £5 million of this funding was provided by my department with £1 million from DERA to extend this programme into rural towns and villages. The programme was designed to provide a maximum flexibility, enabling councils, councils to work with local stakeholders to tailor their schemes to, to meet the best needs of their areas. Linda Dillon, supplementary. Can I and can I thank the Minister for her answer and just also want to thank her for the, the funding because it was very, very much appreciated, I can assure you, by businesses right across Mid Ulster and also Minister Poots to, to our rural businesses. Can the Minister give us an update on whether the criteria for tranche two will be changed or whether it will be the same in relation to getting the most meaningful outcome? Well, I just want to say to the member and indeed to the rest of the, the Assembly, the criteria for this needs to be as flexible and as open as possible. There should be no impediments or barriers to prevent people getting access to much needed support. And that is working with the economic development units within each of the council areas. We are hoping that we will have additional money, not just from my department and Minister Poots, but even Minister Mullen has expressed an interest in this around green and blue um, environment projects, but also looking at you know, sustainability of travel. And it is, you know, for me, my responsibility is 5,000 over population, Minister Poots is 5,000 and under, and that does cover an awful lot. But what we know up until now, small, small bits of money have made a massive difference, and councils need to work with the local businesses to ensure that support's on the ground. Well, Robbie Butler. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for uh, her response to the question. Uh, can the Minister advise if the Department were involved in the design of the overall recovery revitalisation revitalisation scheme in order to achieve a consistent approach across the, the councils and I do accept that there needs to be a level of flexibility but consistency is also important. Rural revitalisation is hard to say at times. <laughs> I've struggled with it myself but yes the assurance is there both myself and Minister Poots want this to be accessible to people. It does need to meet their needs. They do need to go through the due diligence along with the local council. Local councils have worked with these people for a number of years. And consistency in a good way is really important. If people feel, and I'm asking any MLA, they feel that there's been a negative experience by in their consistencies, just let me know. I'm not promising or giving guarantees they'll fix it, but I need to know what it is. Moving on, I call Shania Nannis. Question six, Speaker, and can I apologise for not being in my place uh, th during the last section? I thank the member for her question. To date, the Sports Hardship Fund was awarded over £1 million worth of grants to 500 grassroots sports clubs and organisations to help them cover essential costs, including maintaining their facilities during lockdown and paying critical overheads. These clubs who have not been in position to complete their sessions. So I've asked officials to explore extending the criteria for the fund to include sports clubs who are now experiencing financial hardship due to increased operating costs and costs associated with the facility hire and cleaning regimes. And as a result, I'm pleased to announce that the Sports Hardship Fund will reopen on the 1st of October. Supplementary, Sinead Ennis. I get to thank the Minister for her response. Uh, can I ask the Minister how will her department work um, collaboratively with uh, Sport and I to ensure there's maximum support for clubs as we continue to emerge from COVID? Well, my department, as a member will know, will continue to work very closely with Sport and I, and certainly if their inbox is anything like mine in terms of the groups, particularly from grassroots areas, um, wrote in just asking for support. They will, they will have no doubt where the needs are. But in fairness, this, this is an extension of a scheme on the basis of responding to the demand that's out there. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr Alex Easton. Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister what uh, discussions or plans um, is her department having with housing associations to try and increase the social housing build? Well, um, I've, I work with a number of housing associations and they've been encouraged to try and identify you know, land that's available for them to build. We're also going through the exercise on behalf of the executive, public land that's surplus, 
for housing. So we're going through that as well, and we're currently looking um, at areas in which potential uh, housing developments can be brought forward. Supplementary, Alex Eason. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for answer so far. Um, Minister, in, in North Down, I have over 1,229 applicants who are under housing stress and over 1,700 on the housing list. Has the Minister's department maybe started looking outside of the box, at maybe looking at the housing executive starting to rebuild again? Um, because that might be a quicker process than the housing associations. And the answer is yes. So under new decade, new approach, two of the aspects are incorporation tax and looking at his, you know, getting rid of the historic debt, for want of a better term. It's not just about the housing side of a better footing to look after their maintenance, but also to, you know, for them to get into a position where they can borrow money to build. Uh, I owe Mark Durkin an apology, the member for FOIL. Um, last question time, I said FOIL weren't the worst housing figures. They actually are. Next to that is North Belfast, next to that is West Belfast, and it goes down. But every constituency is dealing with unacceptable levels of housing stress. I call Joanne Bundy. If I could ask uh, the Minister for Communities for an update on the review of the uh, Common Selection Scheme for Social Housing, please. Thank the member. Um, and that's a timely question, um, because I'm currently looking at the consultation that went out on the allocation of social housing points. Um, I'm hoping to be bringing something very soon to my executive colleagues, to my committee, colleague, sorry, the committee, I'm not on the committee anymore, and <laughs> I have attachment problems, but anyway, to the committee, and then I'll be bringing proposals to the House. I think the Minister has detachment problems. I call uh, Ms Joanne Bunting, supplementary. Um, just on the back of that, um, I'm grateful to the Minister that she's bringing forward something soon, but she'll be aware that hostels are sometimes the only option. Uh, so I'm keen to know what action she'll take to make sure that hostels are brought up to standard to suit those with A, mental health issues, and B, uh, women and men who are having to flee a home as a result of domestic violence. Well, certainly hostels are in a state of fast sums of public money, so they need to be, they need to meet the very best of standards. Um, your last point is something that I've been completely committed to looking at, both as a, an MLA. I feel it's really unfair. In fact, I think it's unacceptable that people leaving their home as a result of domestic violence are not considered intimidated. I think it's completely unacceptable that people who are fleeing their homes are also you know, joining a very big queue and people who are not genuinely intimidated are effectively jumping that queue with so-called threats from groups. And that is a fact. We had a debate in this assembly. I think Farah McCann brought it. And I think it's wrong. So I am committed to looking at not ending intimidation points, but looking at another way, because that is a really, really dreadful experience. But the verification of any claim of intimidation needs to be a lot stronger than what it is. I call Liz Gibbons. Corlin, can I apologise for not being in my place at the last section? Um, can I ask the Minister for an update on her plans for the redevelopment of Caseman Park, please? So I'm, I'm assuming that Sinead and Liz went out for coffee, and that's why the team is apologising for being late. Um, the update in Caseman Park is that it's currently waiting on plan permission, which the Minister for Infrastructure and her officials are carefully considering. I have met with the Ulster Council of the GAA very recently. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever. I've also met uh, with the MP for the area and indeed his colleagues. I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that everything that can be done will be done. Obviously, there will be an increase in costs. We will find out what they are fairly soon. And hopefully, the planning uh, decision is made for Caseham Park and we can get on with developing the last of the three stadia for, for, this, for Belfast. Supplementary, Liz Kimmins. Uh, thank the Minister for her answer. And can I ask the Minister, can she give an assurance that her commitment to this long de delayed project uh, will be delivered urgently? Well, I want to give yourself the commitment, but indeed everyone in this chamber and those outside this chamber, the Kiss and Park is an absolute priority for me. And as soon as the decision is made one way or other, I have action plans for both. But hopefully we will get a favourable decision so we can get on with the construction of Kiss and Park. I call Keith Buchanan. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister so far for answers. Uh, my question relates to the Housing Executive. Is the Minister aware of any delay with the process with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive issuing awards to businesses to carry out works, for example, windows, etc.? I appreciate there is COVID restrictions, but is there any delays in the process? I am aware of some delays. Uh, I know there have been procurement challenges uh, that have set uh, companies back who were awarded applications or awarded tenders for, for maintenance work. Um, I, were, I am aware that the threshold is very low now, so it's easier to make a legal challenge on procurement ends, so it's slowing the programme down on top of a global pandemic. So I'm, I'm, I've asked the same questions as a member have, has, and I'm actually waiting on a report to see how that can be advanced much better than what it currently is. Supplementary, Keith Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so far, Mr. for your answer. Just in relation to that, I've got several co companies within Mid Ulster. They're getting a tight note out across Northern Ireland for business and work, and they've got uh, uh, contracts awarded but not fit to move on that. So I appreciate your response, and just if you could press those for a response as quick as you can. Thank you. And I absolutely will, and I will take it upon uh, myself. As soon as I get an update, I will actually write to the member on that issue as well. They call Harry Harvey. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Could the Minister provide an update on the museum sector's recovery since it reopened, particularly in terms of visitor numbers? Thank you. Well, I thank the member for his question, and I'm, I'm going to ask for an update in terms of visitor numbers because um, you know, the museums did open up. Uh, uh, there's a lot of loyalty towards museums, particularly the Ulster Museum, um, but certainly numbers for all open you know, institutions like the museum and even Titanic have been you know, reduced as a result of COVID, but I'm, I will get an update for the member and, get, and send that to him. Harry Harvey, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Is it likely that our museums will benefit from the Economy Department's voucher scheme? Well, if I know the head of museums, they will ensure that every opportunity to benefit from any scheme, regardless from where a department will, but just to give the member assurance that museums are certainly on the list for the, the, the COVID recovery programme for cult, culture, arts and heritage as well, um, because they do play a vital role and um, they're all struggling and they all need our support. Um, and I'm actively looking at what support I can give the museums right across the board. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you. Um, and I want to go back with the, the, the questions and answers the Minister had around HMOs earlier and just maybe ask the Minister, could you clarify if there are legal limits to HMO densities um, in any particular area, for example, within wards or DEAs? Well, I, I, I'll tell you something that you already know. I know that South Belfast and Coleraine have the highest density of HMOs right across the north. So, um, and that's obviously because of universities, but still not good enough. And I do think we need to look, you know, certainly looking at planning and the, 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 the issues around how many HMOs, concentration you can have in one area is the, the biggest issue up until recently that, uh, that, I, that I've been asked to look at. Um, but certainly, you know, even just from other questions uh, regarding Paula Bradshaw raised it uh, regarding the Holy Lands and South Belfast in particular, and, and if there is a need to change legislation and regulations, I'm going to have to have a look at that because, you know, the way in which HMOs have been given licence uh, and then the regulation and then the planning for HMOs, the plan decision when they come in, there are too many gaps and we need to bridge them. Claire Bailey, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for that answer. Um, but are you aware if there are currently legal limits? Is there an upper limit to what can be passed in terms of numbers of HMOs in any particular area at the minute? And if you're unsure, sorry, if you can look into it and let me know, because I'm struggling to find out. And, and that's exactly what I'll do, um, because I'm afraid to give an answer that I'm going to be completely accurate, inaccurate. But I will. I'll find out and I'll write to you as well. Call Colin McGrath. Speaker, Mr Speaker, could I ask the Minister for her department's social and affordable housing targets for each of the next three years? Well, the member will not be surprised to say I haven't got the money, but I'll certainly. Um, I mean, in terms of social housing, the targets are far too low. The targets are miserable, to be quite frank. 
uh, and affordability is an issue as well. So there has been FTC money went into co-ownership to try to support people getting access to that. Um, there's been an underspent in FTC, but certainly in terms of the targets for social housing, in my opinion, unless we do something radical, we're going to fail every year in terms of targets. Colin McGrath, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, given the housing stress across the island and within uh, the Minister's jurisdiction, what will you actually do to address those miserable figures? Well, what I'll do is I'll look at implementing uh, procedures that will target areas in most need and actually try and look at a new policy of ensuring that the miserable experience of people who are now on the housing waiting list five years plus in Foyle, in North Belfast, West Belfast, just to name the top persistent three worst performing areas, that they're looked at as a matter of priority. Well, from McCann. You took me by surprise, Eric. I was busy listening to the, the Minister. Uh, will the Minister give us an update on how she intends to provide more social housing, particularly in those areas of housing stress? But I think she's probably just after uh, answering that. Just, just to repeat what I said to uh, Colin McGrath, and I can feel Fra's eyes burning into Colin McGrath's head at the back as <laughs> he stole his question, but certainly will commit to look at the areas of highest demand, and we need to ensure that the, the supply is increased to try and reduce that demand as best as we can. Given you have an adequate time to get your composure back again, can you want to ask supplementary? Uh, and again, it's just a, a, a matter that you touched, touched on just there. Uh, will the Minister consider the reintroduction of ring fencing in areas of high demand for social housing? I'm looking at ring fencing and other um, policy changes to try and increase supply to reduce demand, demand in, for social housing, as well as looking at specific targets for affordability, particularly under co-ownership, and looking at how RFTC can be better spent to ensure there's more affordable homes. David Hildich. Minister, as you indicated earlier, as, the, as it moves forward, Casemont Park, there's a potential overspend of in around potentially £35 million pounds at this stage. Will the sub-regional stadium programme uh, under the football, will it also get an increase like for like, as obviously it was set out at the beginning, that each of those sports would have an equitable amount of finance and investment? Well, uh, I'm going to disappoint a member and say it's not automatic that that happens. There's been many big capital projects that we've dealt with that have overrun and spent. It's not good enough. I understand what he's saying. But it's not automatic that if the figure is X amount, that that will automatically be transferred over to soccer. That's not my understanding at all. David Hilde, supplementary. Thank you. Um, indeed, just to, to take up further, have you had any discussions with the the Minister of Finance or indeed the Executive with this position at the moment? Well, I suppose that, uh, yes, I have met with the Minister for Finance mm -hmm. over Stadia and Sub-Regional, and I have met with them in terms of, we're all looking at guesstimates, but until we actually bottom out what the cost is in terms of Case and Park, we are going to be dealing with speculation, and we are looking at, uh, looking at addendums and finalising the uh, business case for Sub-Regional as well, because things have changed from the first one was done. But uh, I, I'm just being honest with the member. That don't assume that there's going to be an automatic translation for an overrun for Case and Park and the remainder is going to go to soccer. I haven't heard anything like that at all. And members, the uh, time is up, and that concludes question time. Uh, I invite members to take their ease to allow time. Point of order, Mr Buckley. Earlier today, in questions to the First and Deputy First Minister, I asked a question to Junior Minister Kearney uh, on number three, the question to Mr Kelly. Um, I did not receive a response or even an acknowledgement from the junior minister. Uh, I, I think I, I heard Mr. Speaker.